Welcome everyone. Uh, so this is our training webinar session for the new functionality to kind of handle enrollment functionality in the mycourses.org catalog. So I've got a really rough agenda for us. Uh, as I said, this is going to be very informal. This is going to kind of be meant to address the needs of the folks here in the room who are asking questions, but it is also going to be recorded and shared publicly uh, so that folks who want to access it later can actually do so and see some of the, uh, the the functionality in action as we go along and not necessarily have to rely on some kind of static help documentation. So first I'll just kind of provide a, a short background and overview, then we'll actually switch over. I'll share my screen and just kind of walk through some of these processes and allow questions as we go along um, and then we'll just kind of close with some questions and some feedback from you all about how you might think this uh, function will function in your district or in your own setting. Um, first, just a, a little bit of background on this process. Um, Michigan Virtual is tasked every year through the State School Aid Act to maintain a catalog of online courses throughout the state. Uh, originally that was um, specifically to 21F courses and uh, is basically set up through Section 21F of the State School Aid Act. Um, section 98 of the State School Aid Act is the section that um, sets forth the initiative for us to kind of maintain this catalog. Uh, in more recent years, in the last couple years, Section 98 has been including language for us to develop this new functionality so that districts can actually handle some of the enrollment processes and requests through the catalog itself rather than trying to rely on outside systems. Um, we know that districts who are pretty mature in this process, who have been doing this for quite a long time, may have their own systems in place. Um, and we are not advocating for, in any sense, for all enrollment requests to be handled through mycourses.org. What we are doing is simply providing another option for those districts that might not be uh, as mature in this area so that they can use a system like this to try and track the requests that come through throughout the state and handle some of that functionality within the system. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and, and start getting into the process itself. And what I'm going to do is actually share my screen. And if you guys have any questions along the way, please feel free to interrupt me as we go. Okay, can everyone see my screen okay? Okay, perfect. All right, so um, the first kind of, um, the, the, the first thing that's required for anyone to kind of participate in this process is what we're calling kind of like an opt-in. And so, to do that, a district has to either opt in to the system or to the process by becoming either a provider of online courses or managing kind of what we're calling primary enrollments. And so what I've done is actually kind of um, created a couple test accounts in which I will walk you through uh, some of the, the, the way we envision some of this happening. So let's imagine that you are school district A. You don't necessarily um, offer online courses in the catalog, but you have students within your district who want to take online courses from the catalog. Um, in order to kind of field those requests, we've built the ability for you to actually create an account within the catalog so that you're not necessarily offering those courses, as we said, but you are fielding those requests. You're managing the records that come in as a result of those requests. Um, so what I'll do is kind of show you how, if you or fall, fall into that kind of scenario if you just want to field requests from your own students to take online courses you can do that so I'm gonna log into this account that I'm calling a primary manager and you can see that I've actually set this up under the Ann Arbor Public Schools um, entity account which I'll go back and and delete later but just for the purposes of kind of illustration here this person will imagine this person is uh, at Ann Arbor Public Schools and they are fielding requests from their own students their own resident students to take courses from uh, an outside district so as 
a, a user here, you're logged in for the very first time in the system, and you have a new kind of tab here up at the top, which we're calling Enrollment Management. So if you click this Enrollment Management tab, you can actually see that you have two separate options. You have a Manage Primary Enrollments and Manage Provided Enrollments. So in the scenario that we're talking about, you are the primary district, or you are really the student's primary district. You are the district where the student goes to school, uh, and they want that student wants to indicate to you through the system that they want to take an online course. Um, in order to kind of be able to, to, to field those requests, you actually need to go back to this second tab up here called Entity Management. So if you click on this Entity Management tab, you can see your entity down here is Ann Arbor Public Schools, so it's just confirming the entity that you belong to, and there's an Edit button. So if we click this Edit button, we have a couple different options. The first is what we're calling allowing primary registration. So this is exactly what I mentioned earlier. You want to allow your students to indicate to you through this system uh, that you are um, fielding their request to take online courses, uh, meaning you have an account, you'll be notified when those requests come in, and you'll be able to see all the details of those requests, and you'll see what those details are as we get further into the process. The second is kind of a, the second scenario that I was going to lay out later, but that is the offering district. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll walk through that in a little bit, but that would be not for necessarily the primary district uh, to field those requests, but for a district who actually wants to allow requests to come to them to take the online courses that they are offering. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, this third field here would be for someone who actually does not want to opt into this primary registration. So if they were to leave this box unchecked, they can actually provide a little bit of context about why they don't field these requests through the catalog itself. Um, and that could be someone who um, is not fielding those requests because they have a separate system already set up and they would like to route those students to that separate system. So you can enter any kind of text here into this HTML editor to indicate to those students who choose your district as their primary district um, that they are not able to make the request through the system and maybe give them other options to do so. But for the purposes of this demonstration, we are going to go ahead and opt in to allow primary registration, and then we click Submit. So that means now that, again, you'll be able to field these requests from the public itself. So what I want to do now is just kind of walk through the ways in which the public would actually indicate their interest to take those courses. So I'm going to log out of the system, actually. I'm going to start from the home page. So we're going to put ourselves in the role of either a parent or student who's looking for an online course option uh, for their student for, let's say, uh, the, the, current, the upcoming school semester. So um, that we still have the basic and advanced search tabs. I'll use the advanced search tab just to try to find some courses more quickly. And um, I'm going to search by an offering here from Michigan Virtual because I, I think this will be the easiest way for me to illustrate the point. Um, and I may actually need to log back out and log back in to make sure that Michigan Virtual is set up to field requests, or not necessarily field requests, but field um, registration. But let's let's just let's let's walk through the scenario together and see whether or not um, I need to do that. So we'll come down here, we'll find any course that a student may be interested in, and you can see you still have the availability to click the actual syllabus here. These are still linked so that you can open the syllabus up and get more detailed information, or the user can directly click this register link, which would take them directly to the kind of how to enroll tab. I'm going to go ahead and click the syllabus link here so I get the full syllabus view. You can see all of these options are still here under the syllabus. If I were to click that register link, it would take me over here to this how to enroll tab. 
So if I come down to this how to enroll tab, I get some of the same information that's always been present. So again, for districts who, um, for districts or providers who have their own separate processes, their own kind of separate uh, ways of doing things, they can still direct folks that, that way to this information. And then I have some language here about the fact that um, going through this process on mycourses.org is not technically an enrollment process. It is really just the process of indicating interest for enrollment and that there are some parties that still need to come together to make sure that students are actually enrolled. So this is really just starting a registration request and not necessarily registering for an online course. So if I were to click this start registration request button, I would come then to the registration request form and you can see all of the details that get recorded on any registration request at this point. So we have the student's first and last name, a phone number, gender, birth date, home address. Many of these fields are required fields, so uh, these will hopefully help with districts record keeping so that they can go back and keep accurate records and detailed records of the, the enrollments that they are recording. Um, there's also an option up here at the top, which is what we're calling kind of like our fill form option. So anytime a student actually, or a student or a parent fills out this form for the first time, it's going to generate a unique record and a unique kind of record code. And so if students are making multiple requests, they can actually use that code to auto populate all of these fields the next time they come in to do that because we assume some of that stuff will probably stay the same from uh, request to request. For now, I'll go ahead and fill this out and you can see the generation of that unique code. Justin, yes. with this form, since this is a Michigan virtual course, and I noticed that it shows up under our entity because we offer your courses through us, does yes. the request then go to you at Michigan Virtual? In this case, yes. So what, in, in this scenario, this is a request uh, on a course that is offered by Michigan Virtual because the offerer in this case in the catalog is Michigan Virtual. Um, if they were to select a course that That's was be quote, unquote, offered by Ann Arbor think, Public Schools, then it would come the to the catalog manager courses, uh, from that district. But if they click on our courses, then the request comes to us. But if they click on your courses, then the request request will go to you. And they still have another step to, to enroll with us, regardless of which course you're taking. Well, well, let me let me clarify. So, what will happen actually? So, let's say uh, an Ann Arbor Public School student wants to take a Michigan virtual course. They will fill this out. Eventually, this information will wind up okay. going to the course provider. But okay. at first, it will go to you because you can see down here they are required to indicate their school district and their school building. Our families then have to fill out so a form. Once, once they select, once they make those selections, the that's how they the, that you would be notified. Every course. Potentially, for your situation, that may that may be the case, um, and that's why we we aren't making this kind of a, a required process. My apologies. I'm just going to try and fill this out pretty quick. My apologies, I'm just going to try and fill this out pretty quickly here. So this is the field that we were mentioning earlier, the school representative email. So this is a field that would hopefully um, fill in 
assuming that the, the, the district where the student goes to school did not check that box earlier to allow primary registration. So um, let's say this, the student goes to a school that didn't check that box, they would maybe or hopefully know of an email address for a counselor at their school, uh, a teacher, someone who handles something like a request like this, that they could at least indicate their interest um, to that person. Um, and that way, th I think that was kind of our, our intention for that was so that we wouldn't have to automatically opt everyone into this process and still be able to kind of facilitate that flow of information. So um, for the purposes of this, I'm just going to go ahead and enter my email address one more time. And um, because we set up those, those um, allowances earlier, I'm going to select Ann Arbor Public Schools as this student's primary district. So when I click submit, I get a confirmation. Um, oh, that's odd. I've gotten a denial. The school the child attends does not allow registration requests. I don't know why that is. So let me go back out and make sure that all of the conditions are set so we can make this happen. Oh, that's why I left it unchecked when I was trying to <laughs> talk about the differences between leaving it checked and leaving it unchecked. Okay, and before I do that, I'm actually going to make sure that a Michigan virtual entity is also set up to field requests as well. Okay, so we'll go through this process one more time and I should have a valid code that I can input to autofill this form. Let's see if, let's see if that will work. All right, so if I fill this form in, we get the auto-filled information, but it does not retain the information for ISD school district and school building because we do still need to perform a check to make sure that that district has opted into the system. So I will select Washtenaw, I'll select Ann Arbor, and then I'll select one of the high schools, and then I will punch in the code here, and hopefully we will be able to get a submission. All right, so 
Our registration request was successfully submitted. Please follow up with your school to continue the enrollment process. For your records, a copy of the enrollment request is also being sent to the email address you entered. So all those email addresses that were entered will also get some sort of notification uh, that a request has been registered. So the next step in this process would be then for the person who kind of fields those requests within the building to actually um, review the request and either um, approve or deny it. So for that purpose, I will go ahead and log in as kind of a hypothetical user at uh, Ann Arbor Public Schools who would then be kind of fielding that request. And again, we are speaking of primary managers here. So we'll come back, we'll log in, we'll go to that enrollment management tab here. Um, we need to make sure that our conditions are set properly. So we'll select the 17-18 school year and we're looking for some pending registrations and you can sort any of these things that come in by status and we'll talk about what these statuses mean in just a second. But for now we're looking for the very first stage uh, in the process would be a pending registration. Someone has indicated interest and we need to either approve or deny it. So you can see the records that have come through. Um, we've got some students who have indicated their interest in some, in some specific courses. And we can see that the, the, what the courses are, we can see the schools that they go to, and we can see what the providing districts are as well. If we go to click the view button, then we actually get the full details from that form that they filled out. And if we review the form, we come down to the bottom of the form and this is the new information that the primary manager is required required to provide. So um, it will be up to that primary manager to kind of select the term. Um, we left that to a school district personnel rather than a student just because we think they'd probably be um, more aware of what term the student is trying to, to actually enroll in. So we, we need to, to select a specific term that's uh, available to them. And then we need to enter some specific information about the student and the enrollment. So um, you can indicate the student's UIC to facilitate, again, a kind of cleaner flow of information between provider and enroller. Um, and then you can also kind of indicate uh, seat time waiver, IEP information, anything that you'd like the provider to be aware of, as well as uh, the assigned mentor, because every school district, or sorry, every enrollment in Michigan is required to have a mentor assigned. So we need to go ahead and assign a mentor. So the 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 this second to last field here is the payment method field and um, this payment method field will only be populated by the payment methods that are selected by the provider so um, in this case the provider of this course is Michigan virtual and um, Michigan virtual has has selected theoretically has selected the payment methods that it accepts and so once it has done that that is going to dictate the payment methods that the primary district is available to choose from. And so you can see the payment methods that are available here. These are, I believe, all of them from within the system. Um, and there is actually the case where someone can actually um, indicate some text to show up for specific payment methods. So let's imagine that you choose credit card or PayPal. The provider can go in and enter some text to pop up whenever that payment method is selected to say, OK, Great, you've chosen credit card or PayPal. Here's the URL that you can visit to actually submit your payment information based on your selection. Or, okay, you've chosen to pay with a purchase order. Uh, here is an address that you can send uh, the that purchase order to us for. Um, different information like that will pop up based on the preferences of the provider, like I said. And then there's a notes field here. This is currently set to be required, but I think we're going to remove this just because I don't know that there are going to be many instances where we need a notes field. But for now, you can, again, just kind of facilitate some more information between parties using this notes field here. And then you would approve this registration request. So now I get my confirmation. Um, it's been successfully submitted to Michigan Virtual, and they'll be notified of the request. Please follow up with them to ensure that they accept the enrollment request. And um, 
for their records, the copy of the enrollment request is also being sent to the mentor's email address. So that mentor has then received notification as well. And then you can see here to submit payment via credit card or PayPal. Um, and then there's some test language there as well. So I'm going to go ahead and close this out. And I think I see some comments coming through the chat. So I'm going to check on those. Okay, so Lisa asked, what if they don't have an email address for a district staff person? Um, that's a good question. We made it a required field. So unfortunately, I think um, it, it, it is, I, I would hope they at least have like a general email address that they could find on a school district's website or something like that for the district that they attend. Um, because it's a required field and they can't submit anything without putting that email address in. So Justin, they could those submit enrollments just kind in there were kind of a surprise email, to me that um, just those to other have ones the were in there. Submitted, but and so I, I just looked at we thought uh, it best to have it be a one of them in there field. and the student just put their email for the student uh, or for the school contact. <laughs> Okay, that's you, you, so I, I saw that too when we walked through and that was a surprise to me as well because this functionality has been kind of like turned on and turned off over the last couple of days. So I, I can did just not go think through it would be and it looks available like available for students to actually students. be submitting requests to you. I can just but, go through and delete um, those I guess requests. some good information finding right now. Will they right then now. be notified that they've been deleted or should I deny them? Because I, yeah, you see these? Yes. Yes, they will. So, right. So okay. if, if, if you click the delete button, then they're actually kind of totally wiped out. And this is kind of like the notion of dropping the request itself. Um, basically to say that the request almost never happened. Um, if you were to deny the request, so if we came back to any of these okay. and then click deny, um, you would then have to provide so I, a legal so justification for that denial deny based there, on language happens? in 21F. Did you get like a pop-up window? Yeah. Yes, I'll go through it right But we do, we do pre-populate. So, oh, you yeah. have all that filled in. Yes, I'll go through it right now, actually. And that doesn't make much sense for someone to actually be denying it, but, but yeah, it's required. maybe we can try to fix that or something like that. Yeah, and that doesn't make much sense for someone to actually be denying it, but or yeah, maybe you can maybe we can try to fix that permission or something like that. Process. Yeah, we can maybe move that to afterward. So if I click deny here, then I get all of the denial reasons from oh. section 21F. Yeah, we can maybe move that to afterward. And I only have to choose one. So if I click deny here, I then I get all of the denial reasons from section 21F. Email address that was entered, I believe for the student and the I only have to choose one. Okay. From the and then once I choose one, then this will trigger so an email back to so you know, the email my address that was entered. I believe for the student and the parent. Pull the email address from that from request the record, and then delete the it and then record, contact record. the student directly. Because I would want to tell them this, make more sense. Yeah, I would want to tell them the appropriate steps to register. But then they wouldn't have gotten to this step if I had the do not allow. I think that would the make primary more sense. Instruct, or primary enrollments unclicked, right? They would right, right. register for this. That's good. Right. They would not have been able to even get that far. They're just eliminate that. So Lisa, I see your comment about um, seat time waivers. You are absolutely right. Um, we probably need to either just eliminate that or figure out some way to indicate um, enrollment in more than two courses per term, because I think there are still some conditions around enrolling in more than two courses per term right now. So maybe we can change the language on that field. That's, that's a, a great suggestion. Um, Let's see, I see some other comments. So if they choose to deny the request, why would they need to fill in the mentor? Okay, yeah, so <laughs> great feedback, and I think you're ahead of me on that one too. Uh, I think we need to maybe try to move that to a different stage in the process. Um, plus the mentor get an email even if they deny it. I don't think that's the way it's set up right now. I do think that would be pointless to email someone who would be assigned it to a, an enrollment 
for that did not take place. So I will confirm whether or not that's the case. Uh, either way, I think if we switch the the kind of order of things, uh, it wouldn't even matter because we wouldn't be inputting mentor information. Um, so thanks, all all great suggestions and great feedback. I appreciate it. So let's see. I'm going to deny Justin Bruno's request here. We come back out. This is another thing that I'm working with our team on to make sure that whenever we come back out to the system, that it's automatically showing, you know, the 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 most viewed pen, um, registration statuses and things like that. So you're not constantly having to come back and select the school year and the status and then clicking search. But those are, excuse me, just smaller things that we're trying to work on right now as we get this going. Um, so. We've seen what it looks like from the primary perspective, um, and we've we've worked all the way up into the point where that primary enrollment request is being handed off to the provider. So I'll come back and show what it would look like then for a providing district to actually approve the enrollment request that's come through. So in this case, we had uh, an enrollment come through. Uh, a request come through for a Michigan virtual course enrollment. So I'm now logged into my own account under Michigan virtual in the catalog, and I can come in and go back to the enrollment tab. And instead of going to the primary enrollments tab, now I'm going to go to the manage provided enrollments tab because um, Michigan virtual is a provider of online courses. We don't actually have primary students, right? So now I see a couple of requests that have come through um, and I can see that they are pending enrollment. So the status, once it's gone from pending registration and then it's been improved by the primary district, it moves to a pending enrollment and then it is up to uh, the district to actually, sorry, the providing district or the provider to um, approve that enrollment. So I come, I take a look at the details here, I click view, I see all of the same information that's been verified and entered by uh, the person who filled out the form plus the person from the primary district and then I would either accept or deny that enrollment. So for the purposes of illustration here I'm just going to go ahead and accept it and then I get uh, an, uh, an acceptance confirmation. So now it is moved to an active enrollment and let's make sure I, I don't I think the the terminology around that status is not active enrollment but we're calling it accepted enrollment. So if I, if I search by accepted enrollment for the current school year, I'll probably have a couple or just one, the one that I just approved. So now this is like an ongoing enrollment. The student is enrolled in the course, at least we're assuming from um, what's taken place in mycourses.org, that that student has been enrolled properly through the channels that, have to, that, they have to be go, that they have to go through between the primary district and the providing district. And they're enrolled in an online course. Um, let's see, I have another question here. Does the provider get it only after the primary district fills out their section? Um, the pro your, yes, the provider only sees requests that have been approved by the primary district. So the 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 enrollment is ongoing. Um, we're in the, the the middle of the term essentially here, and things are going fine. Then we get to the end of the term, and we know also under Section 21F that completion data has to be um, provided for online course enrollments. And so what we try to do in this functionality is to try to combine um, the process of providing that completion data and also moving the enrollment to kind of a finished status or an ended status. So um, in order to do that, I would click the kind of view accept enrollment screen here. and um, this would be me as a Michigan virtual provider or whomever that district is who is kind of offering that online course. They would enter the, the, the information that's required of um, every online course each year uh, enrollment. That would be the total points for the course, the points that were earned, and then it will auto calculate a final percentage. So let's say we got 740 points. I earned an 87.1. So you see it auto calculates there and then I would click submit and then that would move the status to ended enrollment and it would stay under an ended enrollment status and you would basically not be able to touch it at that point and the completion data would then be auto entered instead of um, having to kind of send in the, auto, the, the completion data as we do now under the current processes that exist. Um, the other 
consideration here is for a district that provides online courses that may have a ton of these enrollments, we do have a way to kind of bulk download and then upload that information. Um, that is also something that's a little glitchy right now, so I, I don't want to demonstrate it. I'm working with our development team. There were some Microsoft updates applied to servers about a, a week or two ago, and so we're actually unable to download that file right now. But that is this button that says student performance template. And so if the district had 50 to 100 enrollments, and instead of going to click each and every single separate enrollment and then entering that information, they could click that student performance template button and it would actually retrieve all of those enrollments and it would come back with a, um, an Excel file with, I think it might actually be a CSV, with um, all of those details that came from each of those enrollment request records and then three columns. Uh, for the course total points, the course points earned, and then it would auto calculate again for that final percentage. And then you can see the upload button, which is right here, which you can come back and upload for those specific enrollments. And that would be for each one under the accepted enrollment. So th there is some discussion about the fact that um, what we may try to do is be able to actually select the ones that you want to download because you may not want to, the, the, the system would work such that even if you downloaded a file and then only completed uh, the data for a subsection of those enrollments, so let's say you had 50 enrollments, only 40 of them were ended and you wanted to move them, if you were to complete that data and then upload it back, it should function such that the only the enrollments that you entered the data for would be moved to that status, but we want to make sure that that's the case. And so um, we're trying to talk through the best ways to do that right now, to do that in bulk, but that's what we're thinking right now at least. Okay, I see some typing. I'll hold off for just a second, see if anyone else has any other questions before we move on. I want to come back to the PowerPoint as well before I dive into any other sections here. So Anthony and Cindy asked, for this to work, the student's district must have a representative that uses the mycourses.org site. Yes, basically um, that idea is that if um, a district is going to opt into this process, they basically have to have a user account set up under that entity, right? Um, otherwise, you can't field any requests. You can't really do much else to kind of facilitate that flow of information. And so the only other way to kind of facilitate that flow would be that school representative email field. So uh, you're right, it basically has to be such that they, they have an account and are, and are monitoring it. We, we, I should mention too, I think we've had conversations with you guys at Ann Arbor and some folks in other districts. Um, yes, that would require quote unquote monitoring it. What we did not want was for um, people to be kind of uh, the, the catalog managers themselves to, to get a notification every single time just a, a single request came through um, because requests could be serious, they could be unserious. Um, we didn't want to kind of bombard people with emails based upon the system that everyone can access openly. Um, and so we were thinking about some sort of system to, to, to set up that emails a catalog manager once a week to let them know about um, the, the records within their system uh, or something along those lines. But we didn't, like I said, we didn't want to bombard them. So those are conversations that we're still having. But at the moment, yes, it would require someone to actually go in and monitor and, and keep track of what's going on. Lisa, that is a great point. A student and counselor could definitely sit down together and register all at one time. Um, 
they could they could go the other route like you're saying that the student could request on their own then have that district rep come and improve that district rep being someone who has an account within the system but there is the functionality which i neglected to mention so thank you for bringing it up um, the ability for someone like a catalog manager at the primary district to start the request themselves so let me go back actually and share uh, my screen to show you how that looks. It's pretty much, I mean, you, you go through the same process, it's just a different way to actually start it. So let me share my screen here. Okay, hopefully everyone can see my screen. So if I'm this primary manager at uh, the school district, which we now have set as Ann Arbor, and I go to the enrollment management tab and I'm in the primary enrollments field here, I can click the add new button. And the add new button actually allows me to um, select a course. So this would be that case that you're talking about, Lisa, where you have the student sitting down with you right there. Um, you can actually facilitate the filling out of this information with them. You could actually help them fill the form out and you can click this add button here and that would take you back out to the catalog. You'd be able to select a course with them and then um, once you select that course it would bring you back here. You'd finish filling out the form and it kind of combines the the process into one kind of solid process there, one singular process there. So that would be how that looks. Okay, great. All right, I'm going to stop sharing again here, and I'm going to come back out to um, the PowerPoint just to kind of wrap up and make sure that we've covered everything that we talked about. So we talked about uh, how this got started. We talked about where we've wound up thus far. We talked about the fact that we still need to work out some kinks, and we're fully aware of that, but um, we are not making everyone opt into the process for sure at this point, and we're trying to make it such that people who do opt in can make it work best for them. And I'm hoping that's the case with you guys also. Um, last thing I wanted to mention is that all this functionality has now been documented. And if you, I think hopefully you guys can actually click the link from that PowerPoint presentation, that hyperlink that says knowledge based documentation. But if you click that link, that goes out to the section of the Michigan Virtual website that has all of the help documents from or for mycourses.org. So we did have some kind of older documents that were linked to from mycourses.org, uh, and we're since we're, we're now rerouting a lot of that help documentation to the the new Michigan Virtual.org website, which was launched earlier this year, and. All of this functionality is documented in some way in these documents. So I think we produced seven, I think it was seven new documents, and we rewrote um, the enrolled in an online course document. And so those kind of lay out all the steps that I just walked through. So hopefully they're pretty clearly communicated, uh, and hopefully folks who have watched this webinar or go through that documentation can comprehend the process pretty easily. How would you get to those docs from the MV page itself? So uh, there is, that's a great question. It's it's called our knowledge base, and I think it lives, yeah, it does. It lives under the about section of the michiganvirtual.org website. So if you were just at michiganvirtual.org um, at the home page, uh, there's the menu across the top, and the furthest option to the right is the about menu item and so if you just hover over about and then third from the bottom under that menu is what we call our knowledge base so if you were just at the knowledge base then you would need to know which platform it is that we are uh that you're that you're looking for information on but it looks like it's the second one down uh, all the way to the left which is michigan's online course catalog and i'll link back out to the general knowledge page knowledge base page also Okay, well, I think that's pretty much it for me. Um, we 
again, know this is a work in progress. Um, we are really just trying to fulfill the legislative directive and make something that works for a lot of different people in a lot of different situations. Um, but we continuously want feedback. So um, I'm going to put my contact information back up there. So if you guys ever have questions for me, uh, feedback for me, suggestions on things, this was already really helpful because I've um, come across some things thanks to you guys on things that we should change uh, and, and make different as we go forward. I'm going to include my phone number here. You've probably seen me type it in a couple times already today, but uh, my phone number is here in the chat if you'd like to contact me via phone also. Thanks, Justin. Yeah. I think the only thing, I, I went back in and turned it on so that we could accept outside responses and we're going to try this out and then the primary yeah, is Yeah, of course. Off. Thank you, guys. So I think I have it set up the way that we need to or that we want to try out. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sounds great, Justin. Thank you. Perfect. Yep. And if you guys have, if you